Okay, we're back. We're live we're here on a Monday morning at, I guess it's noon, uh, with Energy 808, the cutting edge. It's a very important program uh, because we have uh, Commissioner uh, Jenny Potter on the show. And we have uh, my, what shall I say, my co-host, Marco Mangelsdorf, who is now going to make a fabulous introduction <laughs> of Jenny Potter. Are you ready, Jenny? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> Go, Marco. Well, thank you, Jay. I actually prefer unindicted co-conspirator, but I will settle for anything that's remotely respectful. So thank you so much for uh, having me on again today. And I am beside myself with excitement and pleasure and joy to have my very dear friend, Jenny Potter, who is joining us today uh, from the commission, actually from Maui to be, uh, to be more accurate, but representing the Hawaii Public Utilities Commission. And uh, I've known Jenny now for going on a couple of years. Uh, we met at the Verge Conference, which you may remember was uh, back in the day when there were big conferences with lots of people in a, in a big auditorium. And uh, we just kind of immediately hit it off and we've become uh, good friends and, uh, and kind of fellow travelers in the energy, in the energy path. So Jenny has been on the commission since uh, July 1 of 2018. Uh, she has another four plus years in her term, which takes her to uh, June, 30th, uh, 2024, if I'm doing the math correctly. And uh, I just feel she's uh, she's a rock star there on the commission, along with uh, Dr. Jay Griffin, also uh, very esteemed, and uh, the more recent of, uh, arrival of Leo Asensio. So I just have such uh, confidence and faith uh, that we have truly a stellar commission. And I think uh, it's just fantastic to have Jenny on the commission and, and fantastic that she joins us again today. So. If she hasn't blushed uh, too uh, too dearly, uh, thank you again, Jenny, for coming on with us. That's it. That's it, Marco. That's that's it. That's your introduction. I don't, I don't want to put her in a state where she's so embarrassed that she can't speak for the next twenty five minutes. So I'm I'm trying to go moderate on the praise, Jenny. <laughs> what's what's your reply to all of that, Jenny? Well. I think Marco is too kind, but he did have a lot of facts straight. I I do sit on the commission. I did meet him at a Verge conference. All the rest of it's just his interpretation. So <laughs> it's great. Uh, thank you so much for the kind words, Marco. I appreciate it. I don't know if you have you want to add anything, Jay, but I'm <laughs> just teasing. Well, no, I do. I do. I, I I was thinking that the last time I saw you was at the uh, Hawaii Energy Policy Forum legislative briefing in the middle of January, just around the time the session opened and you spoke. And uh, Marco said you were a star in that. I, I have film, I, I have proof of this. Uh, <laughs> and and the, the part that I remember that was so impressive was that uh, you told me about this kind of new ethic about moving things quickly at the PUC, which we, you know, we all appreciate. Everybody left, right, and center, we all appreciate that. It was very good remarks. If you ever want that footage, I can, I can provide it. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you. I might take you up for that. <laughs> that. And that was in the middle of January. We, we didn't even know about uh, the coronavirus at the time. I mean, the, the, I recall there was a, a bit of a scare about it at the, uh, it was the same week, uh, at the Pacific Telecommunications Conference, where they thought somebody had traveled from China into Hawaii, and you know, and that was bad, uh, into the conference, at which there were seven thousand people, you know, um, but but it, it really didn't take root either statewide or nationally in the middle of January. Uh, we we had to wait for at least a, a couple of weeks before anybody really took note of it there in January. Mm -hmm. But now certainly it's changed our world. It's. Uh, and it continues to change our world. It has almost unpredictable effects on institutions, on the community, on individuals, on the everything. And so uh, I guess one of the things I'd like to ask you about today, we both want to know, is how has the COVID affected the PUC and you as an individual commissioner? Well, it's been a huge change to our business operations, first and foremost. Uh, we moved everyone off, off of the office, out of the office, and onto a remote um, telecommuting right at the beginning. It was, it was like March 13th. Um, so, so we got a head start before everyone else. And, you know, our chair, uh, Chair Griffin, he really saw the writing on the wall with this coming. So he started preparing for that trans, um, that, that change in our organization well before um, we came to the point where the state actually closed down 
um, and, and decided that everyone should be telecommuting. So that, that was a significant change. And thinking about how we were gonna continue our operations and how we were going to continue issuing orders and doing public workshops and, and having our hearings, our status conferences, that was a huge uh, undertaking to, to make that, that uh, migration, if you will, over to, to these remote sort of hosted platforms. So we have been able to do status conferences and some, some of them we've had 75 people in a, in a room um, in a room, a virtual room. And, yeah, and that's been pretty remarkable that we've been able to continue business that way. Um, in terms of the utilities that we regulate, that's been a real challenge. Probably one of the larger challenges we're going to have to face as commissioners, certainly during our time, but this is unprecedented, what's happening right now to our economy and, and to the people who live here, um, and losing their jobs. We have a third of the population unemployed and we have utilities that uh, are having cash flow problems because they aren't necessarily able to collect um, on the bills that they issue. Uh, they also, we have uh, utilities that offer essential services such as Young Brothers that are had to reduce the cargo loads that they, they take on to the ports because there was concerns about the health and safety of their, their employees. And one of the reasons for that was if they had one employee that became sick, it could cut down and close the entire port for 14 days while there was some recovery. And so that, that some people don't understand why some of those changes to the types of cargo were, were implemented, but it was really to reduce as much contact um, from person to person as possible and to protect those employees. Because one other thing that happened was the governor put in a quarantine for any anybody flying into island. So that really restricted the ability for them to transfer employees from one port to the next. And so they were, they were pretty much stuck with the personnel that they had at, at that port and if anything were to happen to them, it could close down the entire port. So that in and of itself created some severe reductions in, in, uh, in revenues from, from uh, cargos and in what they were able to transport. Uh, and that's led to a pretty dire situation where they're looking forward and seeing about $11 million worth of losses um, by the end of the year. And that's assuming that things sort of stay, stay the way that they are at this point. But um, because of that, you know, they've now been looking at other options such as closing down or re restricting some of the sailings to the neighbor islands so that they can uh, really reduce some of that loss. And some of the, the changes that they're implementing can be, uh, you know, can basically recover about 6 million out of that 11 million if they reduce those sailings. Um, so it's been a pretty, uh, pretty severe uh, situation for, for our utilities and for the maritime transport. Um, the, the utilities are also dealing with quite a, a situation where, you know, they, they've suspended any disconnects and they're not collecting interest anymore. And they're really trying to help in any way that they can um, while protecting their employees. But these, these lead to some times where there, there's lack of liquidity within the utilities. So they're, they're in situations where it might be difficult to raise funds to pay for um, you know, some of the services that they provide while they're not collecting revenues from state that's very economically, uh, you know, uh, uh, just uh, incapacitated almost at this point yeah. with the end in sight. So, well, you know, this, this, this kind of reminds us that you do regulate things other than energy. Uh, you know, we, we get into a, you know, a, um, a viewpoint that you're only looking at energy. That's not true. And when we have, um, you know, uh, the crisis of of COVID, we find that, oh yeah, you do regulate transportation, inter-island and all that. Very mm -hmm. important uh, that you mention that um, because I, I certainly that's that's the lifeline uh, for a lot of people to eat and get that's the right. essentials that they need and that, ha that has to be attended to. But going back to energy for a minute, you know, one of the things that has been made clear is that people, the utilities are not, you know, disconnecting these days. I assume, I mean, we know that from Hawaiian Electric and I assume it's so for KIUC as well. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, that means that they have to pay their fixed expense um, right. and uh, which is, you know, formidable fixed expense, huge physical plant, uh, all kinds of fixed expenses, uh, but they're not getting revenue. And furthermore, I mean, I'm, I'm just guessing here, but it's not like there's a you know, a pot of cash at the end of the rainbow where everybody's going to say, oh, yeah, I owe you some money. Why didn't I pay you for my back bill? 
I'm, I, I, I would hesitate to think that's going to happen. It may, it may never get paid. That bundle of uh, indebtedness may never get paid, um, mm. which puts a lot of pressure on them. And I suppose, um, you know, you guys are progressive and you know this is happening and somehow you've got to incorporate that into your thinking. How do you incorporate that into your thinking? So, so we've been tasked with thinking about this for several of the utilities. We've actually, uh, there's, we're issuing an order. I think we haven't issued it, but it should be coming out today. And it was in response to a letter from the consumer advocate regarding utilities and cutoffs and how to manage some of the bad debt that is very likely to come from the scenario. And in that order, we are um, authorizing and requesting that the utilities start documenting their uh, their their losses as reg regulatory assets, which means it's something that they can you know count on over time and rate base over time to recover some of their costs. Um, or some of those losses, but it, it basically spreads out the pain, right, and so, of, of some of these losses over time and sort of socializes them, if you will. Um, so there's definitely some mechanisms that we have in place, but there's definitely a need for us to get creative right now, as you know, so many other utility, as so many other commissions and utilities across the country are dealing with these very same situations and it's it's so unfortunate it's so difficult to balance the needs of the consumer along with the vitality and the health of of the the, the utilities because they are essential services and what's what's so difficult is making decisions that do that are going to impact both sides there i mean this there's this is a kind of situation there's very very few winners that are going to come out of this so how how can we do our best to make people as whole as possible in the midst of this because some people will not be able to pay their electric bill they will not be able to pay back bills so it may be fine that we're looking at suspensions all the way through june 30th but the reality is is you know with the airlines cutting off service to the different islands over the next, until like September. I mean, these are pretty significant. People are not going to have their jobs back. And so this isn't something that's a short-term issue. I mean, this is going to continue on for years, potentially, while we get back to a type of new normal. And it may not be a new normal. It may be just something completely different because this the state may have to reinvent itself. And the utilities that are providing service are going to have to think about doing things in a way that's different than they have before. It's just we're not going to be able to run run the boat this way. We can't just cut off thousands of people for electricity, right? I mean, that's not that's not acceptable. Marco, your turn. Oh, we've taken a, a very deep dive uh, within 15 minutes, and it's kind of head spinning. And what it brings to mind, uh, if you, you think back to the Great Recession and the phrase too big to fail, right? What, what comes to me is, is less so too big to fail, uh, more like too important to fail. And when you look at what the PUC's uh, jurisdiction uh, is over from uh, water, telecom, transportation, and power, uh, it seems to me that uh, the power and the and the transportation end of it, as Jenny's been talking about, uh, is really necessarily garnering the most attention. And I think your comment, Jenny, that is, of course, not just Hawaii PUCs, but PUCs across the country are finding themselves in, in new, uh, new waters that uh, there's no Nehru guidebook, most likely, to be able to go to chapter six, page 32, and see in the event of a pandemic, what to do. So I guess, my question, Jenny, is, and, and you've already kind of touched on this, but I'd like to, I guess, hear a little bit more of your thinking on this uh, and your feeling on this, that trying to find that balance uh, as a commissioner and as a commission in terms of, yes, Hawaiian Electric cannot be allowed to fail. Yes, YB cannot be allowed to fail. KIUC cannot be allowed to fail. And where's the dividing line between letting the free market move forward as things will with this pandemic and yet on the flip side tapping into the public trough so to speak whether it's ratepayer money or taxpayer money i mean it's the same same group of people essentially where where is that dividing line between action versus inaction between 
intervention and non-intervention and, and, and you know, fully realizing that I'm asking you a relatively impossible question to answer, but uh, I, I'd like to hear you give it a shot, please. Well, let me let me add another impossible factor, okay? Which Thanks, we've been Jay. talking about. I just want to <laughs> I just want to add one factor that I think needs to be added, and that is um, we we are in the lockdown, which was was will continue at least to some degree. People be locked up in their houses like we all are. Um, they they are using electricity. They are watching television. Television is a, a richer source of engagement maybe than it was, and both on um, the, 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 you know, the entertainment side and on the non-entertainment side. And electricity in their homes becomes really critical to keep, to keep their, their concerns down. Um, and if, if we went to a blackout, if we went to a failure, uh, even a partial failure, um, you would see amazing things happen in the community. Um, because the community depends, especially now, on, on, on power being fed to those homes. I, and I'll just leave you with one thing. It was in the newspaper this morning. Uh, aside from the increase in domestic violence we've seen here and around the country in the past few weeks, there was a guy in Kalihi that was doing target shooting out of his window with a rifle, um, shooting something across the street. And of course, the neighbors heard the sounds of the gunshots and they came and arrested this guy. Um, and, and my immediate reaction to that is we're going to see more of that. And so we've got to make sure that at, at this time, especially this time, I'm, um, I'm not talking a year or two or three, I'm talking about now. Um, we, we have to cope with the possibility of a very unhappy population. Okay, I just want to add that to Marco's question. Yeah. Now I kind of forgot Marco's question. Marco, can you summarize that again? <laughs> For sure. So the notion of, uh, in this case, we have publicly regulated companies. So let's focus on, let's say, YB, Transportation, Hawaiian Electric, KIUC. We have companies that cannot be allowed to fail. Mm -hmm. They're too important to fail. They're big as well, but they're, they're too important to fail. So what kind of guidance can you go by? I mean, is there any guidance you can go by? which I think the answer to that is really no, mm -hmm. but you, you can of course take a shot at it, uh, to try to balance between market forces allowing, we allowing market forces to do what they do, which is to winnow, right? Those who are you know, Darwinian in, like, in, in fashion. Um, and yet we have companies here in our state that really cannot be allowed to go under. So where's that dividing line between public regulation, public intervention, public support, and allowing the market to do its thing. Right, right. When you, when you say market to do its thing, I, I actually, I think of, you know, market forces laissez-faire. I think of, you know, capitalists where we, once we go up market, best determines the best price for goods and services, and that sets the, the, the the actual quantity and the value, you know, do like economics 101 kind of, um, so, so, and I don't think that's necessarily what you're what you're referring to. Um, but the market, I think, what you're referring to is, you know, if these companies cannot be viable right now, then you know, then what is our option other than if you you either allow them to fail, you intercede, and you basically make take some type of action to basically put a Band-Aid on or or some other service, and then or you you fully subsidize them or take you know take them under your wing and and basically. Uh, fully accommodate them. Um, and I think that there's, you know, obviously we we have to balance the needs of, of the, the residents here in Hawaii and the, the, the needs, uh, which is also to receive these services, right? I mean, it's not, it's just, just getting, you know, the, just having them available, but being able to deliver electricity when it's needed, as it's necessary, meaning like your refineries are still operating because there's so much there's so much interconnectedness you know is our refinery still operating so that we can get bunker fuel and can we produce naphtha that's used by hawaii gas and all of these things are being impacted by the decrease in demand across the board for natural gas for fuel or you know, for bunker fuel, as all of the demand for that has decreased, mm -hmm. it's impacted the bottom line for all of these companies dramatically. And so how they're trying to recover, or even maintain services is in the public interest for us to 
find solutions as their partner because we have to maintain reliability and service to this group of customers, to our customers on, on all the islands. But the, the challenge of finding that balance for, you know, bailing them out completely <laughs> versus, you know, trying to find a solution that can help them get through this in the short term and basically get over to the other side. I think that's that's the, actually what we're being tasked with right now and will be the biggest challenge. And as you mentioned, there is no guidebook. There is nothing in history. And I don't know that Hawaii is actually, I think Hawaii might be one of the most difficult places in the US for this because there are not, there's no many community choice aggregators as there are in, in Oregon. There's no market wholesale market operator in like the ISO that helps manage load through all the Western corridor. I mean, if you have so many other options in other jurisdictions, which we just don't have here in Hawaii. And so how we come up with a toolkit to basically wrench on this thing is going to be have to be decided in the very short term, right? I mean, we don't have that much time as money is now at the point for these companies is now starting to become more of an issue. And so that's, that's just going to be something that we have to, to continue to find new solutions, which there aren't a lot at the top of my head. So I, I'm glad I have a really bright team that can help think through this stuff. And the companies also are thinking about this as well. All of the utilities are thinking about this as well as ways that they can reduce their cost and they can try and come to the table with some solutions because they don't want to bring us any bad proposals. You know, that's not going to work either. So it's it's actually got to be a, a team effort. Everybody in the canoe, canoe rowing, right? So, but it's yet yeah, there's no there's no guidebook. There's no precedent here. There was some discussion a few weeks ago about uh, the CARES Act, and I must say, I do not know how it ended up, but uh, maybe Marco, Jenny, you know what happened uh, as to whether any funding uh, loans or otherwise uh, was provided to utilities around the country, many of which are having problems right now. Um, or are they, as far as the CARES Act and federal funding, are they on their own these days? I, I actually don't know anything about the utilities um, getting any any sort of money, federal money at this point. Um, I think that there's still some something in the works though for them. So uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure that the, all the checks have been signed at this point, but we'll see. Marco, do you know anything about that? I think I would uh, back you up on that, Jenny. I mean, I haven't been following the the day-to-day the -day blow to blow minutia, but it seems to me it's been a triage approach on the part of the feds to give money to those who need it the most, not to say that utilities aren't needing it certainly, but I think that that's a, a work in progress to be able to come to the financial aid of, uh, of utilities and, and that uh, line of business. You know, the only thing I remember about, um, you know, an, an issue that surrounded that possibility was uh, as in the case of the airlines, the federal government, the White House, uh, wanted to negotiate for stock in, in these utility companies. Uh, so it wouldn't just be, you know, a gift. It would be something in respect of a stock interest. They tried that with the airlines and there was a lot of pushback. And I don't think they did that with the airlines, but I'm not sure how it worked out on the utility side. Anyway, uh, let me ask you this, Jenny. What, you know, what about your, what your big initiatives? I mean, you have a, a, a PBR initiative last time I looked. And of course, you have a clean energy initiative with lots of you know, jobs in the pipeline. Um, is that all falling second place to this, the, the question that Marco asked about trying to balance things and keep everything in, you know, in, 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 good, in good order? They, thank you for asking that. <laughs> so um, I, I didn't pay you to, to ask that, but um, we we at the, the commission have set out several priorities for, for our organization in, in response to this emergency. And the, the first is really to encourage and continue to promote the clean energy revolution. Um, so that that's really imperative. So in all of our decisions, we're going to see that underlying, you know, vein in them. Um, and, and that's currently under happening right now. Um, the second is economic recovery. And that's actually something we're really taking by storm. So we're focusing on dockets as of now that can really 
uh, improve and encourage and promote economic recovery. Um, and that, that includes things like the, the, the community-based renewable energy program, um, the DER docket, our distributed energy resource docket, of course, the performance-based regulation docket. Uh, these are all dockets that, and integrated grid planning. That's another one that we're, we're focused on um, pretty heavily right now as well. Microgrids. Um, so quite a few dockets that are, that are coming up here in an effort to to really send a signal to the market that Hawaii is open for business and we want them to come in in particular on these clean energy projects and be able to invest money here and do it in, in a way that's in the short term, mid term, not something that's the long term. So what we're picking up in particular with the DER dockets um, with the distributed energy resources, the DER, sorry, I hate it when we use acronyms, and, but that, that one in Particular, we're really working with the, the parties and the and HECO, and this is the DER solar parties. And Marco knows a little bit about this stuff, but, but trying to, to encourage the, the utilities to really streamline and fast track their process for interconnection because these DER providers are really going to be an integral part of, of our economy and, and trying to build in that recovery. Here's how we're getting building permits and we're continuing to invest in, you know, cons consumers are continuing to invest in these types of projects and programs. And, and that's, that's something that's, that's absolutely paramount to us. So we have, we have changed or continue to maintain um, and changed and emphasized economic recovery within our our priorities for the commission and our activities on a day-to-day -day basis. So, and that runs true to our um, to our motor carriers that are on the ground, really trying to improve some of the, the processes for them, and as well as the fines and not issuing fines and, and delaying some of their filings and the cost for that. So it's across the board for all of our uh, all of the entities that we regulate. Well, it sounds like you're really working hard, Marco. Is there anything uh, in that that you want to follow up on? No, I would like to dramatically shift the conversation from one of uh, great seriousness and import where, we're, where we've been over the past 25 minutes or so. And in the few minutes we have left, it's shifted to a much more personal level, which is, uh, I would like to ask Jenny, just since we're all amongst friends and BFFs here, what, what would you like to share with the rest of us that might be coming as something of a surprise if they heard it? Sure. Um, I want to preface this by saying, you know, there's, there's a, um, you cannot judge that you cannot predict the future from the past. Um, and that's, that's one of the, the big ideas I think in my life is uh, that I've had to hold on to. Um, and then also don't look back, you're not going that way. That's my, that's my personal favorite, <laughs> but both of those relate to, to this. Um, I, I actually, about when I was about 16 years old, I, I dropped out of high school and I never went back. So I, I ended up um, getting into college off of some really great SAT scores, but you know, it's something that for, for many years for me was, uh, was a big black stain on, you know, on my persona of just thinking I wasn't quite worthy or capable because here I had dropped out of high school. So how, how was I actually floating through this maze of life without having, you know, a proper education? And, you know, it's something that, uh, that I now have realized, you know, that's probably what made me who I am, you know, of getting out of that. But uh, I don't know of many commissioners that are high school dropouts. So, <laughs> <laughs> so what's the plan? <laughs> what's that? What's the plan? What's the plan? For what? Are you going to take a PhD now? Oh yeah, <laughs> I have my master's. I think I'll stick with that. I keep thinking okay. of PhD, <laughs> masters. I got my master's at Carnegie Mellon University, which is one of the, the greatest schools I think in the country. And and so you know that that helped delete some of that that black stain. But um, but yeah, so it it was an impressive journey for sure. <laughs> well, you know, I it, it almost go ahead, Marco. I'd like to add that she's, uh, Jenny is getting her PhD right now in, in PUC. So she's gonna have a PhD in PUC before no time. And I'm just gonna kind of riff a little bit off of your, your, uh, your story there. 
Jenny, which is, you know, anybody who's gone through a PhD, which I have, uh, it knows it's a long slog. Uh, it can be a very long slog. I was on the 10 year plan. And that uh, early on, I actually failed not one, but two of my PhD exams. So this, uh, this uh, notion of not looking backward, I think is a very good one. And, and what, what failures that we have as beings as we proceed in our own course in this life are, are just as, as much, if not more so, instructive and certainly humbling uh, and learning experience that allow us to be better people. Uh, so that's, uh, I, I just wanted to add my own uh, uh, admission and confession to yours as well. Thank you. <laughs> well, what you guys, you, you, well, I, um, I was telling Jenny before we started that I, I went to NYU Law School, which, which is behind me in this scene right here, <laughs> uh, twice. I, I had to go twice. I went for my, um, my uh, undergraduate law degree and then a graduate law degree. And uh, it, it, it really, I don't think about it much, but since we're talking about that, that's my, that's my disclosure. The second degree has not really been relevant to my practice in a long time. That was a degree in taxation. Anyway, thank you for sharing, Marco. And, and thank you for coming on, Jenny. I hope we can do this again soon. It's cool. great to talk to you. It's great to have this conversation. Definitely. Uh, yeah, say goodbye to the people. Bye, people. <laughs> Marco, you too. Goodbye, people, but especially you too. <laughs> Thank you very much. Aloha, nice you guys. Both of you. Stay well. Thank you. Thank you.